Welcome back. In today's episode, we continue with part two of the interview with Steve Wallace. What's the best advice he received from head coach Bill Walsh? And how to use self-doubt to drive your success. Welcome to this edition of Peak Peak Performance Performance Podcast Podcast. with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Thor Conklin here. We give you the tricks, the tips, the tools, the strategy, the technology, and the psychology peak performers use in order to get more done and execute at the highest level. If you know what to do but struggle with getting it all done or simply want to raise your game to the next level, this podcast is for you. Sit back and enjoy. Tell us some of the best advice you've ever received, either from a coach, a player, parent. You know, oh, I'll tell you what. Um, once... Um I was having it out with Bill Walsh, and Bill Walsh was coming at me about losing weight, losing weight, because he noticed, like, my rookie year, I was, like, upper 290s, 295, 299. And then my teammates gave me a nickname, and that nickname was Big Sexy. (laughs) Okay. Great identity. Okay. I mean, why am I going to lose that? Exactly. (laughs) Now, uh, Randy or Thor just heard that in one second. He immediately started laughing. And then guess what? That's all my teammates, when they heard that, when a guy is kind of chunky around the midsection, built like a pear at that time, then immediately you start laughing. No, because no, you you're know, big sexy now. Absolutely. That's it. All our friends yeah. is going to be big yeah. sexy. It's total sarcasm. No, no, yeah. I, I, no. I, I think it's – No, but that, that's how they – that's exactly <laughs> what happened. I'm just explaining what, you know, what happened. You, they would say that. And then guys would just die laughing. And you're sitting there like, well, I guess, you know, there's nothing sexy about me. And, and then the wives would come over. And then they were like, I heard about your name, Big Sexy. And they would die laughing. It, it, it was kind of partly uh, embarrassing. And then I lost about 10 or 15 pounds. pounds. And, and then, then you, you were know, Big I, Sexy. And then everybody was like really, you know, inquisitive about it. Like, or, like, is that really your nickname? Like, what? And so it felt better that, you know, maybe it was more valid then and then, but before it started out as total sarcasm. And so Bill Walsh asked me to lose weight. And then I was like, man, you know, I'm so frustrated with him. You know, why is he on me about my weight? Because the guy in front of me right now in my rookie season, his name is Bubba Paris, and he has a weight problem. And then my second year, I started at 22 years old. Uh, my second year in the NFL, because, I mean, I can imagine, you know, some of these kids at 22, they, they just don't get it. But in my second year in the NFL, Bill Walsh said, I want you to lose weight. And then I started finishing my blocks. I was like, wow, I'm so quick. I'm a, it's amazing how much better I can move. And then I went to uh, this guy. His name is Raymond Chester. Played probably before me uh, 10 years. He played with the Raiders, played with the Colts, was a great tight end. And then I was talking to him. He was teaching me some golf. And I was like, Raymond, don't you think I should go talk to Bill Walsh and uh, get on him about making me lose weight? He looked at me. He said, young fella, let me tell you like this. He said, at the end of my career, I was talking too much, said all these things. I could have played four or five more years. He said, the the one thing I failed to realize, the most important thing is that I was cashing checks every Monday when I was uh, when I did everything according to what the team wanted. He said, only thing you need to do is go there, close your mouth, lose the amount of weight that he said, and you may become the type of player he thinks you can become. And then that was a huge part of why I, I did well against Lawrence Taylor because I was so quick. If I was 299, there's no way. That guy's just too quick. He's around me. He's going to knock Joe Montana yeah. out. Then they got to find the next guy. And for him to tell me, most important thing is as long as you cash those checks on Monday because one thing about the NFL – if you have three bad games in a row and you may be a guy that you, you are all pro two years in a row, uh, man, I'm going to have a 14-year career. You have three bad games, the fans will fire you. You know, nowadays they'll call in on social media, your butt will be out of there. And it, and it happens that quick. I've seen guys that had great years, four in a row, and they got long careers, and then they have three bad games, you're out of yeah. there. What's the biggest hurdle you've had to overcome? realizing that I had talent enough to play the game. And then one of the uh, great stories is uh, in the book, The Blind Side. That was a book written about, like you said before, uh, a blind side protector. The guy, you know. If and he, that was here in Georgia, wasn't it? Absolutely. They, they did the movie with the young guy and the twoies, uh, Leanne 
and her husband, uh, they, it was a great uh, story about Michael Orr and, you know, that whole adoption process. And it, it was just really, really neat, and it was awesome. Got to meet them, got to meet Michael, and uh, got to meet the Tuies. And so they were just really kind folks. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when they wrote that book, you know, I, I had to earn that title. You know, that title was not given to me. I mean, I had to go out there and literally have street battles where, you know, a big part of it for me was like sometimes uh, if, if a guy, I say accidentally got around and hit Joe, then the next play I would start something. I might headbutt the guy or accidentally hit him with a karate chop under the chin. Or well, accidentally now. Right? <laughs> and hit him and then I, I don't think the NFL yeah. can find you anymore. Yeah. And so by the third time around, you've I've headbutted him. I say, hey dude, I'm sorry. You know, my bad. <laughs> we co- compartmentalizing now. You know what I mean? I gotta be that 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 wrestler, that 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 mindset, you know. And then uh then chop him under the chin and you hit him with a vicious chop and it hit him with so quick he doesn't realize it just jars his head right, you're just trying to interrupt this pattern Th- that's all just I gotta want. get him out of his game and, 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 and that and, happens to all of us in life every day and, and i'm gonna show business. you absolutely and i'm such a kind-hearted guy that i, I dude i'm so sorry i got my hand up there I, I totally didn't mean it and by the third time around like chris dolman uh was a, a hall of famer all pro guy and then going against him and then by the time I hit him with that karate chop, he said, uh, my bad. And I said, I'm sorry, my bad, Chris. I, I tell you, I didn't mean to do that. He's like, my bad, your ass. The next time it's going to be, we're going to be fighting. <laughs> and before the next play even happened, we were at it. And he had hit me and doing all kind of stuff. But at the same time, I was like, I got him. And so his mind. Right. Exactly. Is, you got him out of his game. Absolutely. Yeah, his yeah. mind is focused yeah, yeah. on who? Steve Wallace. Yes. And it was yep. a brawl. Yep. It, it was an all-out brawl that um, him and I were at each other, and then we were fighting on the field. And I, didn't, I wasn't worried about it. Heck, I got beat up a lot as a kid. <laughs> but I got on a total armor, and, you know, I was girding up my loins <laughs> and all this goodness. And and helmet, I got everything. Yeah, except- I never understood the guys that take their helmets off. It's like, why are you Absolutely. taking your helmet off? Absolutely. So Keep the you, armor on. in the face, you're going to probably break your hand. So I got all this on. So I wasn't worried about him yeah. fighting. I knew – if I, if I kept him close to me, everybody else would jump into it, and then you just kind of got to, you know, fake it a little bit. Like, hey, dude, come on. Keep bringing it. Bring it, man. And so from that point on, he his mind was no longer on yeah. hitting Joe yeah. Montana. And uh, so that was uh, one of the stories in the book, The Blind Side. And then Chris had something a little better than that. The next time we got him in the playoffs, and then Chris is sitting there, and he goes, that Wallace, he thinks he's a smart, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so uh, we we had an interview during the playoffs. So Monday before the game is on Sunday in the playoffs, and I had a group of reporters came up to me and goes, Chris Dolman said that uh, you fight to cover up for for your lack of ability to be a good lineman. And he caught me off guard, meaning he totally got me. You know, he's very cerebral. Uh, just he 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 figured it out. Interesting. So he Absolutely. used it back on you, but he yeah. used it with words. Yeah. And so when he said that, the reporter has uh, had to be five of them with these mics in my face. I, I was just stone faced. I didn't know what to say. I was like, I got, I'll go, uh, 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 I'll get back with you because he had totally figured me out. And which there again had totally messed with my mind because earlier uh, in that first game, can you imagine if a guy hits Joe Montana? He hits Joe Montana. This is when I started all the fighting stuff because I had to get his mind off Joe Montana. And the guy turns around and say to you, I'm going to hit Joe 99 more times. And hell, I'm just a young guy. I'm thinking like 99 I'm going to get fired. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. 99 more times. Monday morning, I need to go get another job. 99 more times. And he totally messed me up there. And then he hit me again with this thing that I fight all the time to cover up for my lack of ability. And I know I was a good tackle. And so that week, you know, I'm going through – Spending the whole week like just totally confused and it messed up my mind so bad. I'm at home at night kicking my wife in the bed. She wake me up like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, Chris Dolman's going to hit Joe 98 more times tonight. You know, she's like, you're dreaming. Wake up. And the next night, you know, Chris Dolman got 80 more times to hit Joe one time. And so eventually I came up with something else, a fireback. And that was that 
she said in the middle of uh, one night, maybe Wednesday night, she said, why don't you not fight him? And so my, you know. Oh, so, so don't do said, what he was expecting. Absolutely. If you don't fight him, then that'll mess him up. And so the next game out, which was a huge game, this game is what kind of turned Joe Montana's career around. And Chris Dolman was, had 20 sacks, was defensive player of the year, and was MVP at every single, you know, probably at the SB Awards that they would have had it back then would have probably had five trophies to him alone. And so we're getting ready to play that game. And then I just like I had made up my mind. I don't care, Chris, if you can you kick me in the ding ding or whatever, then uh I'm still not gonna fight you, you know. And I and so the whole game he's kinda looking at me like, What's wrong with this fool? Like, you know, I, I know I'm waiting on it. I'm waiting. <laughs> so and you distracted him absolutely. again. Absolutely. And by the yeah. fourth quarter, Chris had made a tackle all day. Because I know he had to be thinking like, I'm waiting. I'm, I, I've been waiting on this. You you got to do this. And that made me become a better tackle. And so, uh, you know, like what we were asking about how I questioned myself and doubted myself. And then I said, if I just play this guy and do the things I'm supposed to do, because one of my great quotes is great technique. Great technique in business and whatever you do can't be beat. Great technique can't be beat. If you do the things that you're supposed to do, then even on the football field, 95%, you have enough talent, you're there, uh, then you're going to have a, a good play. And it's just when you get out, you get a little high, your feet goes a little here, there, whatever, and you don't do the things that you're coached to do, then that's when you're, you're going to get beat. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what occurred when you had to make that shift from player uh, in the NFL, in the spotlight, to retired, mm -hmm. then going into business for yourself. I'm sure that the NFL player was part of your identity. How did you have – that shift how did you make that shift we have a lot of people listening that uh in their lives they've go through identity shifts yes how did you go through it and, and god that was use? hard that was that was so hard you know um and i, I want to relate it to uh it's all relative to when you're 35 years old and then you know the 21 year olds come out and party and then you realize you're not, you know, getting any attention. So you kind of go, I kind of got to change this a little bit, you know. And then and it's every stage of life. And then by the time you get 40, it's like you don't need to be in those places at all with the 21-year-old. And it's, it's that transition. And and it's doing it and then, you know, just kind of jumping out there. And which uh, for me, which uh, when I retired, I said I wanted to do something. So I got in the building. Uh, I studied uh, the cable Got my building license. I mean, heck, I, I, I thought the first time I, I went in there, I got embarrassed because I just thought, you know, I know how to build. I know the steps. I know the stages. You don't know the codes, mister. And so uh, I flunked the test the first time and made like 65. You got to make like 75, 80 to pass. And then I went back. I studied my butt off because that was really embarrassing. Like, dude, you don't know the codes. And you got to uh, understand what safety is. You you know, for somebody's foundation to be rocky and shaky, you want to make sure that you, you protected this family. You know, that you, you created no liability on yourself, that you understand the heights of uh, stair rails, at what they, they should be. You want to make sure you got the right amount of steel and it's uh, strapped down properly in that foundation. You want to make sure that you got anchor bolts in that uh, house because a strong wind blow through here, you know, hurricane, you whatever, and you, the whole house is gone. And so you want to make sure that you 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 uh, accounted for all of these small things. And, and then one good thing, if you're a good builder, you learn that uh, the code is the bare minimum what you could do. And so if you're a good builder, you know, learn that you, why not do more if it's affordable? Mm. And then this makes this house stronger. If I can make uh, a wall that's normally uh, 12 inches wide and 16, if it's not costing that much more, if it costs a thousand dollar more, what the heck, make it. And and then you learn like uh, the pressure of water, like it feels good, you know, uh, in a house when you can turn on the water and somebody else is not getting burnt, you know, with <laughs> hot water being in the other room. And so you want to do all those things that make you a, a great builder. And then you start studying things just like, uh, you know, one of the secrets I had was thermostats. You know, why put a thermostat in a hall in a hallway when nobody's ever really in the hallway? <laughs> put it in the rooms that you're going to be in. 
And so you start studying the little detailed things, which is like football, that make you a, a better builder, you know, it, and, and to make sure that, you know, all of the um, returns and so, you know, air – and sometimes overdo it. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, air conditioning is straining. I mean, that's a horrible situation. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so many people go into business – trying to figure out what the minimum they can do in order to get by as opposed to what's the best I can do here to provide the most value to my clients. Absolutely, because if you if you take that approach, then you're not going to be going out to visit them on repairs as much because you've built a solid home. Uh, you've accounted for water getting out. You know, when you when you go into that house, you got to study like right now. OK, how's all this water going to come out and how is it going to get away from the house? Because you don't want constant water on that foundation. And then you'll see sometimes where people didn't anticipate like right around the front door. Where is that water going to get away from? It's going to go right down and sit right in that spot. It's going to be a problem. And and, and then even with roofs and, and pitches and all different type of things. And the most important thing, like you said, if you do more, then you're going to have less problems over the long haul. Absolutely. Tell us something that you've been afraid to try up to this point. Oh, uh, gosh. Let's see. Um what have I been afraid to try? Uh, well, I, w- I was making, uh, I, I don't want to give away my whole idea, but, you know, doing some things to teach young kids how to, if you're going to play the game, how to play it safe. And so uh, to teach kids uh, how not to lead with your head, you know, because a lot of times uh, when we came into football early on, you were taught to hit people with your head. And then now uh, that we've s- had an opportunity to sit back and analyze football. We were, we were able to see that, okay, you can play this game, you know, because people were upset with some of the rules that you weren't knocking guys out on the field. And the game wasn't really designed to just knock everyone out. Now, you'll have some banged up shoulders and, and you'll use your shoulders more. But at the same time, you take away that impact that, that, that brings that pressure from your toes straight through the core of your body using the uh, crown of your head to hit someone uh, almost like a weapon, like like uh, throwing a bomb at somebody almost in a sense uh, with all that pressure going at them directly. And and the thing is, is to teach kids how to play and, and then you won't have neck injuries, you won't have head injuries, and especially if you play through the core of your body using your hands a great deal. Because a lot of guys, they get out there, they're in the pros three or four years before they finally – Realize, like, oh, my God, I can use my hands. Well, you know, (laughs) you've just been bumping, guys. If you use your hands to put them on a guy quicker, then you're going to have control a lot quicker. And I was teaching a couple of Georgia Bulldog guys out here the other day, and uh, and, and I asked the guy, I was like, what's wrong? Is your hand broke? He he looked at me like, no. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, why aren't you using it? And he's like, well, yeah, you got a good point. I was like, you mean to tell me you, you're backtracking and you're just kind of shielding the guy, but you're never putting your hands on him. How you gonna, How are you ever going to gain control? Not only that, what the – excuse my friend. What the hell are you benching 500 pounds for <laughs> if you're not going to use your hands? You're not going to use your strength. You're not going to use your power. Well, you know, it's a good point, too. As an offensive lineman, you were always responding to what someone else did first. Absolutely. And in life, reacting is never a great strategy. But that was a, that the only strategy that you had. How do you combat that? How do you succeed in football, in life, in a reactive position? That's uh, a difficult thing to learn. And what you have to learn is you have to do something over and over and over again that you turn it into a reaction. And, and what I mean by that is that – if I got, if I'm going against a guy, his great move is a spin move. Okay, if this guy is my scout team player on defense and I'm practicing against all week, dude, I don't need you trying to make the damn team uh, going against me like you're trying to show the culture that you can play. Do give me the look, give me the look of what that opponent does. And then this is one thing: when I played later in my career, they had free agency who had guys like Richard Dent. Um, uh, Chris Dolman that played came to the 49ers and I was like damn man practice is going to be so hard every day practice was like a, a cakewalk because they were like I want to see the look of what that guy's going to do and these great all pros is that they know if they see that look over and over and over it becomes a reaction and prob- probably you can um, 
tie it in or it correlates to like uh, a race car driver. Like if he's seen it enough times and he knows how to react because when you get there, you don't have time to think about it. And so if a guy's doing a spin move, then I've seen it enough time in practice over and over and over that it triggers my mind immediately to react because if I got to spend a split second thinking about yeah. it, yeah. I'll never get it right. Okay, so just to kind of recap that, Practice it over and over again. Over and over. So the reaction is just automatic. Absolutely. You, okay. you don't have to think about it. Is that your mind, and, and, I, and in, in the video I'm putting together, is called trigger. And what happens, if you see something over and over and over again, uh, and I would tell a guy one out of five times, I got to see his greatest move. And yeah. so with that, if it's a spin move or if he's grabbing my shoulder or something like that, or if he's going to run over me, then my mind immediately, before it happens, it has to trigger where his position is. That's what I need. Yeah, I, I you almost react. know what he's going to do before yeah. he even does it. I can't think about it. I have My body and my mind have yeah. to react. And I think the point here is, so many people don't want to take the time yeah. to do that repetitive motion over, over and over and, and over, over again. again. And it's so important to be able to yep. do that so it just happens. You know, we teach a lot about identity and just instead of trying to stay motivated about something or trying to force something, make it part of your core. Yeah. So when it happens, it just, boom, Absolutely. there's my reaction. Absolutely. Like a great comedian, you know, when they see certain things, they've done it enough time, it creates a trigger. And and sometimes you think on the run, but uh, and, and it makes them funny. You know, they're well prepared or a great speaker, well prepared with something that happens and they've done it enough time, then they tweak something here or there to their audience and there you go. Who do you admire the most? That concludes part two of our interview with Steve Wallace. Please tune in later this week for part three. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already done so, please head over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Also, please share this with family, friends, coworkers, or anyone that could benefit from this information. To make it very easy to share these episodes, simply go to my Facebook page, Thor Conklin, click on the episode that you want to share, and you can post it to your timeline. You just might be helping one of your friends on Facebook by sharing it on your page. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Thor Conklin. The website is thorconklin.com. The email is info at Thor Conklin. While at the website, please sign up for our weekly newsletter with additional tricks, tips, tools, and psychology on how to be a peak performer. Remember, these episodes are anywhere between 6 and 35 minutes and are meant to be consumed during dot time doing other things. Until tomorrow, have an absolutely amazing day.